The Brown Fairy Book by Andrew Lang. Rubazel. Over all the vast underworld, the mountain gnome Rubazel was lord, and busy enough the care of his dominions kept him. There were the endless treasure chambers to be gone through, and the hosts of gnomes to be kept to their tasks. Some built strong barriers to hold back the fiery vapors, to change dull stones to precious metal, or were hard at work, filling every cranny of the rocks with diamonds and rubies. For Rabazel loved all pretty things. Sometimes the fancy would take him to leave those gloomy regions, and come out upon the green earth for a while, and bask in the sunshine and hear the birds sing. And as gnomes live many hundreds of years, he saw strange things. For the first time he came up the great hills were covered with thick forests, in which wild animals roamed, and Rubazel watched the fierce fights between bear and bison, or chased the gray wolves, or amused himself by rolling great rocks down into the desolate valleys, to hear the thunder of their fall echoing among the hills. But the next time he ventured above ground, what was his surprise to find everything changed? The dark woods were hewed down, and in their place appeared blossoming orchards, surrounded cozy-looking thatched cottages. For every chimney the blue smoke curled peacefully into the air. Sheep and oxen fed in the flowery meadows, while from the shade of hedges came the music of the shepherd's pipe. The strangeness and the pleasantness of the sight so delighted the gnome that he never thought of resenting the intrusion of these unexpected guests, who without saying by your leave or with your leave had made themselves so very much at home upon his hills. Nor did he wish to interfere with their doings, but left them in quiet possession of their homes, as a good householder leaves in peace the swallows who have built their nests under his eaves. He was indeed greatly minded to make friends with this being called man. So taking the form of an old field laborer, he entered the service of a farmer. Under his care all the crops flourished exceedingly, but the master proved to be wasteful and ungrateful, and Rubazel soon left him and went to be shepherd to his next neighbor. He tended the flock so diligently and knew so well where to lead the sheep to the sweetest pastures and where among the hills to look for any who strayed away, that they too prospered under his care, and not one was lost or torn by wolves. But this new master was a hard man and begrudged him his well-earned wages, so he ran away and went to serve the judge. Here. He upheld the law with might and main, and was a terror to thieves and evil doers. But the judge was a bad man who took bribes and despised the law. Rubazel would not be the tool of an unjust man, and so he told his master, who thereupon ordered him to be thrown in prison. Of course, that did not trouble the gnome at all. He simply got out through the keyhole and went away, down to his underground palace very much disappointed by his first experience of mankind. But as time went on, he forgot the disagreeable things that had happened to him, and thought he would take another look at the upper world. So he stole into the valley, keeping himself carefully hidden in copse or hedgerow, and very soon met with an adventure. For peeping through a screen of leaves, he saw before him a green lawn, where stood a charming maiden, fresh as the spring and beautiful to look upon. Around her upon the grass lay her young companions, as if they had thrown themselves down to rest after some merry game. Beyond them flowed a little brook, into which a waterfall leapt from a high rock filling the air with its pleasant sound and making a coolness even in the sultry noontide. The sight of the maiden so pleased the gnome that, for the first time, he wished himself a mortal, and longing for a better view of the gay company, he changed himself into a raven and perched upon an oak tree which overhung the brook. But he soon found that this was not all a good plan. 
He could only see with a raven's eyes, and feel as a raven feels. And a nest of field mice at the foot of the tree interested him far more than the sport of the maidens. When he understood this, he flew down again in a great hurry into the thicket, and took the form of a handsome young man. That was the best way. And he fell in love with a girl, then and there. The fair maiden was the daughter of the king of the country, and she often wandered in the forest with her playfellows gathering the wild flowers and fruits, till the midday heat drove the merry band to the shady lawn by the brook to rest, or to bathe in the cool waters. On this particular morning the fancy took them to wander off again into the wood. This was Master Basil's opportunity. Stepping out of his hiding place, he stood in the midst of this little lawn, weaving his magic spells, till slowly all about him changed. And when the maidens returned at noon to their favorite resting place, they stood lost in amazement and almost fancied that they must be dreaming. The red rocks had become white marble and alabaster. The stream that murmured and struggled before in its rocky bed flowed in silence now in its smooth channel from which a clear fountain leapt, to fall again in showers of diamond drops, now on this side, now on that, as the wandering breeze scattered it. Daisies and forget-me-nots fringed its brink, while tall hedges of roses and jasmine ringed it round, making the sweetest and daintiest bower imaginable. To the right and left of the waterfall opened out a wonderful grotto, its walls and arches glittering with many colored rock crystals, while in every niche were spread out strange fruits and sweetmeats, the very sight of which made the princess long to taste them. She hesitated a while, however scarcely able to believe her eyes, and not knowing if she could enter the enchanted spot or fly from it. But at length curiosity prevailed, and she and her companions explored to their heart's content, and tasted and examined everything, running hither and thither in high glee, and calling merrily to each other. At last, when they were quite weary, the princess cried out suddenly that nothing would content her but to bathe in the marble pool, which certainly did look very inviting. And they all went gaily to this new amusement. The princess was ready first, but scarcely had she slipped over the rim of the pool when down, down, down she sank, and vanished in its depths before her frightened playmates could seize her by so much as a lock of her floating golden hair. Loudly did they weep and wail, running about the brink of the pool, which looked so shallow and so clear, but which had swallowed up the princess before their eyes. They even sprang into the water and tried to dive after her, but in vain. They only floated like corks in the enchanted pool, and could not keep under water for a second. They saw at last that there was nothing for it but to carry to the king the sad tidings of his beloved daughter's disappearance. And what great weeping and lamentation there was in the palace when the dreadful news was told. The king tore his robes, dashed his golden crown from his head, and hid his face in his purple mantle for grief and anguish at the loss of the princess. After the first outburst of wailing, however, he took heart and hurried off to see for himself the scene of this strange adventure, thinking, as people will in sorrow, that there might be some mistake after all. But when he reached the spot, behold, all was changed again. The glittering grotto described to him by the maidens had completely vanished, and so had the marble bath, the bower of jasmine. Instead, all was a tangle of flowers, as it had been of old. The king was so much perplexed that he threatened the princess's playfellows with all sorts of punishments if they would not confess something about her disappearance. But as they only repeated the same story, he presently put down the whole affair to the work of some sprite or goblin, and tried to console himself for his loss by ordering a grand hunt. 
for kings cannot bear to be troubled about anything long. Meanwhile, the princess was not at all unhappy in the palace of her elfish lover. When the water nymphs, who were hiding in readiness, had caught her and dragged her out of the sight of her terrified maidens, she herself had not had time to be frightened. They swam with her quickly by strange underground ways to a palace so splendid that her father's seemed but a poor cottage in comparison with it. And when she recovered from her astonishment, she found herself seated upon a couch, wrapped in a wonderful robe of satin, fastened with a silken girdle, while beside her knelt a young man who whispered the sweetest speeches imaginable in her ear. The gnome, for he it was, told her all about himself and his great underground kingdom, and presently led her through the many rooms and halls of the palace, and showed her the rare and wonderful things displayed in them, till she was fairly dazzled at the sight of so much splendor. On three sides of the castle lay a lovely garden with masses of gay, sweet flowers and velvet lawns all cool and shady which pleased the eye of the princess. The fruit trees were hung with golden and rosy apples, and nightingales sang in every bush, as the gnome and the princess wandered in the leafy alleys, sometimes gazing at the moon, sometimes pausing to gather the rarest flowers for her adornment. And all the time he was thinking to himself that never during the hundreds of years he had lived had he seen so charming a maiden but the princess felt no such happiness. In spite of all the magic delights around her, she was sad, though she tried to seem content for fear of displeasing the gnome. However, he soon perceived her melancholy, and in a thousand waves strove to dispel the cloud, but in vain. At last he said to himself, Men are sociable creatures, like bees or ants. Doubtless this lovely mortal is pining for company. Who is there I can find for her to talk to? Thereupon he hastened into the nearest field and dug up a dozen or so of different roots, carrots, turnips, and radishes, and laying them carefully in an elegant basket brought them to the princess, who sat pensive in the shade of the rose bower. Loveliest daughter of earth, said the gnome, banish all sorrow. No more shall you be lonely in my dwelling. In this basket is all you need to make this spot delightful for you. Take this little many, colored, wand, and with a touch give to each root the form you desire to see. With this he left her, and the princess, without an instant's delay, opened the basket, and touching a turnip, cried eagerly, Brunilda, my dear Brunilda, come to me quickly. And sure enough there was Brunilda, joyfully hugging and kissing her beloved princess and chattering as gaily as in the old days. The sudden appearance was so delightful that the princess could hardly believe her own eyes, and was quite beside herself with the joy of having her dear playfellow with her once more. Hand in hand they wandered about the enchanted garden, and gathered the golden apples from the trees, and when they were tired of this amusement, the princess led her friend through all the wonderful rooms of the palace until at last they came to the one in which were kept all the marvelous dresses and ornaments the gnome had given to his hoped-for bride. There they found so much to amuse them that the hours passed like minutes. Veils, girdles, and necklaces were tried on and admired, the imitation Brunilda knew so well how to behave herself, and showed so much taste that nobody would have suspected that she was nothing but a turnip after all. The gnome, who had secretly been keeping an eye upon them, was very pleased with himself for having so well understood the heart of a woman, and the princess seemed to him even more charming than before. She did not forget to touch the rest of the roots with her magic wand, and soon had all her maidens about her. And even as she had two tiny radishes to spare, her favorite cat and her little dog, whose name was Benny. And now all went cheerfully in the castle. The princess gave to each of the maidens her task, and never was mistress better served. 
For a whole week she enjoyed the delight of her pleasant company undisturbed. Tales sang, they danced, they played from morning to night. Only the princess noticed that day by day the fresh young faces of her maidens grew pale and wan, and the mirror in the great marble hall showed her that she alone still kept her rosy bloom, while Brunilda and the rest faded visibly. They assured her that all was well with them, but nevertheless they continued to waste away. And day by day it became harder to them to take part in the games of the princess, till at last, one fine morning, when the princess started from bed and hastened out to join her gay playfellows, she shuddered, and started back at the sight of a group of shriveled crones, with bent backs and trembling limbs, who supported their tottering steps with staves and crutches, and coughed dismally. A little nearer to the hearth lay the once frolicsome Benny, with all four feet stretched stiffly out, while the sleek cat seemed too weak to raise his head from his velvet cushion. The horrified princess fled to the door to escape from the sight of this mournful company, and called loudly for the gnome, who appeared at once, humbly, anxious to do her bidding. Malicious sprite, she cried, why do you begrudge me, my playmates, the greatest delight of my lonely hours? Isn't this solitary life in such a desert bad enough without your turning the castle into a hospital for the aged? Give my maidens back their youth and health this very minute or I will never love you. Sweetest and fairest of damsels, cried the gnome, do not be angry. Everything that is in my power I will do, but do not ask the impossible. So long as the sap was fresh in the roots, the magic staff could keep them in the forms you desired. But as the sap dried up, they withered away. But never trouble yourself about that, dearest one. A basket of fresh turnips will soon set matters right and you can speedily call up again every form you wish to see. The great green patch in the garden will prove you with a more lively company." So saying, the gnome took himself off, and the princess with her magic wand touched the wrinkled old women, and left them the withered roots they really were to be thrown upon the rubbish heap, and with light feet skipped off across to the meadow to take possession of the freshly filled basket. But to her surprise, she could not find it anywhere. Up and down the garden she searched, spying into every corner, but not a sign of it was to be found. By the trellis of grapevines she met the gnome, who was so much embarrassed at the sight of her that she became aware of his confusion while he was still quite a long way off. "'You are trying to tease me,' she cried as soon as she saw him. Where have you hidden the basket? I have been looking for it, at least for an hour. Dear queen of my heart, answered he, I pray you to forgive my carelessness. I promised more than I could perform. I have sought all over the land for the roots you desire, but they are gathered in and lie drying in musty cellars, and the fields are bare and desolate. For below in the valley winter reigns, only here in your presence spring is held fast. And wherever your foot is set, the gay flowers bloom. Have patience for a little, and then without fail you shall have your puppets to play with." Almost before the gnome had finished, the disappointed princess turned away, and marched off to her own apartments without deigning to answer him. The gnome, however, sat off above the ground as speedily as possible, and disguising himself as a farmer, bought an ass in the nearest market town, and brought it back loaded with sacks of turnip, carrot, and radish seed. With this he sowed a great field, and sent a vast army of his goblins to watch and tend it, and to bring up the fiery rivers from the heart of the earth near enough to warm and encourage the sprouting seeds. Thus fostered, they grew and flourished marvelously, and promised a goodly crop. The princess wandered about the field day by day. No other plants or fruits in all her wonderful garden pleased her as much as these roots, but still her eyes were full of discontent, 
and best of all, she loved to while away the hours in a shady fir wood, into which she would cast the flowers she had gathered and watch them float away. The gnome tried hard by every means in his power to please the princess and win her love, but little did he guess the real reason of his lack of success. He imagined that she was too young and inexperienced to care for him, but that was a mistake, for the truth was that another image already filled her heart. The young Prince Radabor, whose lands joined her father's, had won the heart of the princess, and the lovers had been looking forward to the coming of their wedding day, when the bride's mysterious disappearance took place. The sad news drove Radabor distracted, and as the days went on and nothing could be heard of the princess, he forsook his castle and the society of men, and spent his days in the wild forest, roaming about and crying her name aloud to the trees and rocks. Meanwhile the maiden in her gorgeous prison sighed in secret over her grief, not wishing to arouse the gnome's suspicions. In her own mind she was wondering if by any means she might escape from her captivity, and at last she hit upon a plan. By this time spring once more reigned in the valley, and the gnome sent the fires back to their places in the deeps of the earth, for the roots which they had kept warm through all the cruel winter had now come to their full size. Day by day the princess pulled up some of them and made experiments with them, conjuring up now this longed-for person and now that, just for the pleasure of seeing them as they appeared. But she really had another purpose in view. One day she changed a tiny turnip into a bee and sent him off to bring her some news of her lover. Fly, dear little bee, towards the east, she said. To my beloved Radabor, softly hum into his ear that I love him only, but that I am captive in the gnome's palace under the mountains. Do not forget a single word of my greeting, and bring me back a message from my beloved. So the bee spread his shining wings and flew away to do as he was bidden, but before he was out of sight a greedy swallow made a snatch at him, and to the great grief of the princess her messenger was eaten up then and there. After that, by the power of the wonderful wand, she summoned a cricket and taught him this greeting. Hop, little cricket, to Radabor, and chirp in his ear that I love him only, but that I am held captive by the gnome in his palace under the mountains. So the cricket hopped off gaily, determined to do his best to deliver his message. But alas, a long-legged stork who was prancing along the same road caught him in her cruel beak, and before he could say a word, he had disappeared down her throat. These two unlucky ventures did not prevent the princess from trying once more. This time she changed the turnip into a magpie. Flutter from tree to tree, chattering bird, said she, till you come to Radabor, my love. Tell him that I am captive, and bid him come with horses and men the third day from this to the hill that rises from the thorny valley. The magpie listened, hopped a while from branch to branch, and then darted away, the princess watching him anxiously as far as she could see. Now Prince Radabor was still spending his life in wandering about the woods, and not even the beauty of the spring could soothe his grief. One day, as he sat in the shade of an oak tree, dreaming of his lost princess, and sometimes crying her name aloud, he seemed to hear another voice reply to his, and starting up he gazed around him, but he could see no one, and he had just made up his mind that he must be mistaken, when the same voice called again, and looking up sharply he saw a magpie which hopped to and fro from the twigs. Then Radabor heard with surprise that the bird was indeed calling him by name. Poor Chatterpie, said he, who taught you to say that name, which belongs to an unlucky mortal who wishes the earth would open and swallow up him and his memory forever. Thereupon he caught up a great stone, and would have hurled it at the magpie if it had not at that moment uttered the name of the princess. 
This was so unexpected that the prince's arm fell helplessly to his side at the sound, and he stood motionless. But the magpie in the tree, who, like all the rest of his family, was not happy unless he could be forever chattering, began to repeat the message the princess had taught him. And as soon as he understood it, Prince Radabor's heart was filled with joy. All his gloom and misery vanished in a moment, and he anxiously questioned the welcome messenger as to the fate of the princess. But the magpie knew no more than the lesson he had learnt, so he soon fluttered away, while the prince hurried back to his castle to gather together a troop of horsemen full of courage for whatever might befall. The princess, meanwhile, was craftily pursuing her plan of escape. She left off treating the gnome with coldness and indifference. Indeed, there was a look in her eyes which encouraged him to hope that she might some day return his love. And the idea pleased him mightily. The next day, as soon as the sun rose, she made her appearance decked as a bride in the wonderful robes and jewels which the fond gnome had prepared for her. Her golden hair was braided and crowned with myrtle blossoms, and her flowing veil sparkled with gems. In these magnificent garments she went to meet the gnome upon the great terrace. Loveliest of maidens, he stammered, bowing low before her, let me gaze into your dear eyes and read in them that you will no longer refuse my love, but will make me the happiest being the sun shines upon. So saying, he would have drawn aside her veil, but the princess only held it more closely about her. Your constancy has overcome me, she said. I can no longer oppose your wishes, but believe my words and suffer this veil still to hide my blushes and tears. Why tears, beloved one? cried the gnome anxiously. Every tear of yours falls upon my heart like a drop of molten gold. Greatly as I desire your love, I do not ask a sacrifice. Ah, cried the false princess, why do you misunderstand my tears? My heart answers to your tenderness, and yet I am fearful. A wife cannot always charm, and though you will never alter, the beauty of mortals is as a flower that fades. How can I be sure that you will always be as loving and charming as you are now? Ask some proof, sweetheart, said he. Put my obedience and my patience to some test by which you can judge of my unalterable love. Be it so, answered the crafty maiden, then give me just one proof of your goodness. Go. Count the turnips in yonder meadow. My wedding feast must not lack guests. They shall provide me with bride maidens too. But beware lest you deceive me, and do not miss a single one. That shall be the test of your truth towards me. Unwilling as the gnome was to lose sight of his beautiful bride for a moment, he obeyed her commands without delay, and hurried off to begin his task. He skipped along among the turnips as nimble as a grasshopper, and had soon counted them all. But to be quite certain that he had made no mistake, he thought he would just run over them again. This time, to his great annoyance, the number was different. So he reckoned them for the third time, but now the number was not the same as either of the previous ones, and this was hardly to be wondered at, as his mind was full of the princess's pretty looks and words. As for the maiden, no sooner was her deluded lover fairly out of sight, than she began to prepare for flight. She had a fine fresh turnip hidden close at hand which she changed into a spirited horse, all saddled and bridled, and springing upon its back she galloped away over hill and dale till she reached the thorny valley and flung herself into the arms of her beloved Prince Radabor. Meanwhile the toiling gnome went through his task over and over again till his back ached and his head swam, and he could no longer put two and two together. But as he felt tolerably certain of the exact number of turnips in the field, big and little together, he hurried back eager to prove to his beloved one what a delightful and submissive husband he would be. He felt very well satisfied with himself as he crossed the mossy lawn to the place 
where he had left her. But, alas, she was no longer there. He searched every thicket and path. He looked behind every tree and gazed into every pond, but without success. Then he hastened into the palace and rushed from room to room, peering into every hole and corner and calling her by name. But only Echo answered in the marble halls. There was neither voice nor footstep. Then he began to perceive that something was amiss, and throwing off the mortal form that encumbered him, he flew out of the palace and soared high into the air, and saw the fugitive princess in the far distance, just as the swift horse carried her across the boundary of his dominions. Furiously did the enraged gnome fling two great clouds together and hurl a thunderbolt after the flying maiden splintering the rocky barriers which had stood a thousand years. But his fury was vain. The thunderclouds melted away into a soft mist, and the gnome, after flying about for a while in despair, bewailing to the four winds his unhappy fate, went sorrowfully back to the palace, and stole once more through every room with many sighs and lamentations. He passed through the gardens, which for him had lost their charm, and the sight of the princess's footprints on the golden sand of the pathway renewed his grief. All was lonely, empty, sorrowful, and the forsaken gnome resolved that he would have no more dealings with such false creatures as he had found men to be. Thereupon he stamped three times upon the earth, and the magic palace, with all its treasures, vanished away into the nothingness, out of which he had called it, and the gnome fled once more to the depths of his underground kingdom. While all this was happening, Prince Radabor was hurrying away with his prize to a place of safety. With great pomp and triumph he restored the lovely princess to her father, and was then and there married to her and took her back with him to his own castle. But long after she was dead, and her children too, the villagers would tell the tale of her imprisonment underground, as they sat carving wood in the winter nights. Folks Martian Derdushin End of Rubazel Recording by Sukena Jaffer Toronto, Ontario, Canada